Yeah. Don't show your panties. Huh? Don't show your panties. I'm trying not to. Let me see my panties. In college, my gay best friend and I joked that if we hadn't found love by 40, we'd have a baby with each other. 20 years later, I'm pulling the ripcord. From deciding on solo motherhood to choosing IVF, I'm Meredith, and this is The Backup Plan. So. So. You're here now. I'm here now. I'm it. sitting in your new sofa for the first time. But what do you think? It's nice. It's nice. cushy. You like it? Yeah. Cat do you too. like it? Kitty likes it. Kitty likes it. Okay, so yes. how how do you feel since the last time you were here? Like, you, there was a lot that you didn't get to be here for. And now I missed him. Sorry. That's okay. I called you one night and really was, like, upset that you were going to be here for the egg retrieval. And I was like, I really want you here. Because my understanding was that that was a tough thing to go through, which it ended up not being. But uh, I feel like I had trouble communicating to you that I really wanted you out here and I kind of had to get firm about it. Like, do you recall that conversation? I remember, I remember telling you, if you need me here, I will drop everything and get on a plane and come out. Yeah. But then he decided that you had somebody to help you through it. It ended up working out okay and it's fine. Um, it just wasn't as like pain and labor intensive as I thought it was going to be. Then good, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I would have felt awful if you called and told me how much pain you were in. There. I was just gassy. So I just had the ability to fart freely and not really worry about with confidence. I farted, I farted freely and with confidence. It ended up being okay. But what, how, how have you felt in the past couple of weeks, like watching it from afar? I called you every night for IVF. Every, I watched every, I missed one shot because you had to do it in the morning. Yes. Before an appointment. Yes. That's the only shot I missed. So I did get, to go through all the shots yeah um it was a difficult time for what i was doing and just trying to get that done and knowing what you were going through it was wasn't easy but we did it uh -huh. yeah mm -hmm. it sucks because i wanted to be there to help you move um for context my mom has a house a small house in the town that i went to college and a separate house in orlando and the house in saint augustine sold and she had to move a whole bunch of stuff but that house had a whole treasure trove of artifacts from our history 51 years of marriage and 39 years of children yeah and so there was a lot in the garage that she ended up going through alone which if i was there i would have just like chucked it chuck a chuck a choo chewed my way through everything yeah and uh it sucked to not be there as physical strength as emotional strength and to tell you when to take a break because you don't have anybody there and you wouldn't listen to me when I told you. So it's just, I just wanted to get it done. You know, there was so much that had to be done and I wanted to get out here. So it was just do it and get out here as fast yeah. as I could. Yeah. And it worked. I sold the house settlement on the 24th. Mm -hmm. And um, now I'm here and we can get on with baby making. Well, you don't have to get on with it. That's nothing you I have, have to go through the emotional... <laughs> trauma of being a new nana yeah yeah and so the the place that i'm at right now in time is that we're still waiting on the genetic test results which is frustrating because i'm like when is it gonna happen you just always want to be one step ahead and schedule and it's okay I, just, I do too i just have it planned and i know what the next step is and i just want to get to it but um i still feel good about it I feel nervous about feeling good about it, but it is what it is. And part of the reason I wanted to record with you today is because I am trying to decide what I'm going to do with the answers of this test. And one of the things that I can know, and they are testing for right now, is sex. And I can know the sex of the baby and can basically choose now there are two embryos so one is a four bb five day blastocyst and the other is a four ba seven day blastocyst the four ba is a better grade but because it's a seven day blastocyst it's not 
the choice one. So the choice one is the five day because it's more important that it's a five day blastocyst than it is that it has the better grade. So the 4BB is the one that is most likely the transfer baby at this moment. Now, yeah, I, I because I have two embryos, I can I can know what the sex of them are, and I don't know if I want to know. I've joked with Michael that even if I had one that wasn't as good, which is as good, uh, which is the seven day embryo. I joked with him that, yeah, but if it's not as good and it's a girl, it's still but it's probably still better. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I don't know where I'm at, if, whether or not I want to find out, because it's just two embryos, and one is definitely better than the other. So it's well, not like gender selection at this point. It's it's their gender made already. Yeah. So it's not I don't like know. you're going to wanna... say, make me a girl or make me a boy. Yeah. It's already made i want to know what your choices were in try in terms of finding out sex along the way and i just like give me the history well we didn't have definitive sex identification right i mean some doctors would say oh the heart beats faster so it's it's a girl heartbeat slower i kept telling my doctor i don't want to he always there were four doctors in the practice and one was really good at picking and I kept telling all of them, I don't want to know. And the day I had my visit with him, he went, oh, he's doing great. What about all? And I went, what? And he goes, slow heartbeat, you got, you're going to have a boy. And he was like 99% right. Mm. And I just turned to him and said, maybe it's a calm girl. And that was the first time I didn't let a man stand tell in my you way. What you do. <laughs> Yes. I might have had a penis, and I just, I just <sighs> shriveled it back up and said, "Fuck that!" And I just <laughs> said, "I'm not, I'm not listening to him because I said I didn't want to know, and maybe he's wrong." So mm -hmm. I didn't believe him. Here I am, and I mean, I don't know if there was, I could have had amniocentesis. I guess they can tell you through that, but I chose not to have that either. Why? I first of all worried about. I guess it was something new, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to run the risk of having a problem because I had it. Do you know if amniocentesis has changed from when you were pregnant with me to now? I, I mean, it's been 40 years. I it's, assume, I assume some it's differences. changed. Um, no, I haven't kept up with amniocentesis <laughs> procedures. Okay. So, and I, at that point, I felt no matter what, I'm going to keep this baby anyway. So mm -hmm. why bother? Why find out that you're going to have a baby that has problems and then worry about it for the next nine months, next mm -hmm. seven months? Well, I guess they do it in four months, so it'd be five months of worrying. Yeah. Where I can just plan on having a healthy baby, and if anything goes wrong, I'll deal with it. Yeah. I don't recall if we had this conversation on the last podcast, but I've had so many conversations with you about this whole journey, and we've talked a lot, a lot, a lot about it, and I know I've asked you this. If you had the chance to find out now, would you? I thought about that, and at first I went, no, 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 I want to be surprised. I want to hear them say on the delivery table, it's a girl or it's a boy. But now that I think about it, and so especially since we've had two babies and one of each kind in our family, mm -hmm. it's like, well, maybe it's a good idea. Why? Well, it gives you a chance to plan, quote, plan the nursery mm -hmm. or buy the, the layout and just get ready. I think I also think that maybe if you find out you're having the sex of a baby that she didn't want the sex of. It gives you a chance to to bond with that baby and say, oh yeah, so it's a boy, it's cool, uh -huh. it's great. So when a baby comes out, you know, it's gonna be a little boy or a little girl and you're gonna be, hey, I'm ready for this. Right. Now with the babies in our family, mm -hmm. my niece and nephew, we knew it was towards the end of the pregnancy that we found out about um, the heart defects right. that Mars had. But we found we knew earlier about Phoebe's complications, right? And so I know something, I recall having a conversation with you where you told me that you were really, like she became more real knowing it was a girl and it was Phoebe. I mean, they kind of went back and forth on names a little bit, right? But yeah, yeah. But that you had 
it was like there's the little girl that we have to yeah we got to get prepared for this well and just that you're pulling for her and that was better for you to know that it was a little girl that you were pulling for not that and not that it not that it would matter if it was a boy but just that like it's just a preparation it it makes that it's humanizing realize you know real you were always harvey Mm. why I used to call you Harvey because I watched a movie from the 1930s with Jimmy Stewart. Uh-huh. And he had some mental issues. And he always saw a giant white rabbit named Harvey. And I loved that movie. And I love bunny rabbits. So you became Harvey. Did you feel like I was making you mentally unstable? No. Okay. I was, I was st- checking. Very stable, just like now. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so it just... It, I also, it was something unseen and unknown to anybody else. Mm-hmm. Only Jimmy Stewart could see Harvey. Only I could feel you. And what did you call Dylan? My brother? He was, at the beginning, it was all baby, Harvey number two is here. But then he never, I never really called him Harvey all the time. Right, because you called him something else. The Predator. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, well, he used to push on my stomach so hard with this foot it looked like it was going to pop out yeah well wait was it predator or alien probably alien alien i was yeah. gonna say i don't remember the predator but yeah a- we had watched the movie alien while i was pregnant yeah it was like <gasps> look at that foot yeah. so if you were in my place you would find out as soon as possible or like because it because here's here's my thought process is if they both test a-okay I know I'm going with a five day first. Should I find out immediately as soon as I can when they they call and they say both embryos are great, which they're going to do power positive thinking. Um, should I find out at that moment or should I wait until like the first scan where they can see? That's kind of what I'm going back and forth on now. Mm -hmm. Or do I wait until the very, very end? Yeah. And I don't know because there's so... I would imagine you want to know immediately, knowing you. Yeah, but so then I'm part of me is like... I think they should send me a text message. And we should have a lovely dinner out. And I could have some wine so I could cry a lot. And then I could tell you. Okay. Just you and me? Yeah. At dinner? Yeah. Okay. And then we could have a party for people. Oh, the cat just bit me. See that? He's Stop playing. it. The cat's playing with your toes. Behave. Stop playing with <laughs> my feet. <laughs> um, and then we'd have a party and we, we could bake the cake and if it was pink or blue. I, I'm i of three different minds about this. Like, I do want to know as soon as possible. I like gut instinct is to know as soon as possible like tell me i want to know it all um i like information let me put it on a spreadsheet you know but i'm trying to i'm like is that (laughs) am i that not traditional enough and now um am i like my my worst enemy here would it be better if i i didn't know at all is that more special should i like hold myself back from myself and like just enjoy the process as it comes that's kind of my thought there and that that because so much of this is so planned out all the way that there is some kind of like beauty in not knowing that because everything else has been super planned out okay thought number one that's number one uh well you could do like wait midway through Thought number two is to wait until you do get the scans done and then do some sort of a, do a sex reveal because it's not a gender reveal, it's a sex reveal. (laughs) And um, which like, I have gotten mad about those in the past, kind of irrationally probably because it just feels so like tied to notions of gender, but it's not... It doesn't have to be that. It can just be a cute, it's a boy or it's a girl. Like, you can't deny the biology there of, like, what's happening, right? And in most cases, the biology says it's one way or the other way. Yeah, it could go crazy or it could just be, it could be tasteful. I could do it tastefully. It doesn't have to be, like, baseball and trucks or ballet and unicorns. 
horns. Like it can just be a, it's this or it's a that. So that's option number two. And then option number three is to just know immediately. But I think, I think my fear is that if I know I have two girls or two boys or a boy and a girl that I really, I'm going to humanize it too much. And if it doesn't work out, can it be like really upset? But then the other part of me thinks if something doesn't happen, you're going to want to go back and find out if it was a girl or a boy and still like, I'm going to be upset regardless if things don't. Well, I'm also curious to which kind of babies have a better chance of making it through development. Like I always heard that if babies were born premature, uh-huh. that white baby girls were the highest survival rate. But is that because they're white baby girls and there is a bias? This, or is, this is, it was just a general study. Right. At that but time. But who is giving the care? There is a deep seated thing that people will help the white baby girl and okay. well, care less about say, the black I baby would, boy. Let's look into is there a better chance of a boy survive, out surviving a girl or a girl out surviving a boy? So I'm actually going to bring up this point is a really good time to bring up the study that I found that I sent to you. So I have Apple News and this is on Slate. And it's a story called The Parents Who Want Daughters and Daughters Only. Sex selection with IVF is banned in much of the world, not in the U.S. And this is by Emmy Neatfield. It's really interesting to talk about. And something I didn't know is that sex selection, I just thought it was part of the process. That it was just you find out and you can choose, oh, if I have two or three good eggs and one is a baby boy and the other two are baby girls and I want a baby boy and I can choose that. It's not in the rest of the world. Like I was so surprised when I sent this article to you that the only two places this is allowed is here and in Cyprus. Really? The rest of the world, it is illegal. Like Denmark and Sweden? Correct. Wow. It's considered unethical, which then when you start thinking about it, it's like, oh yeah, it is. Because it's almost like an opposite of the um, one child policy that China had and people the wanted boys. boys. So there was a lot of infanticide and um, illegal abortions and stuff when they found out that they were having girls. Um, and one of the women in this article, uh, she's Chinese and she felt like it was a, like a, a big old fuck you to China. Of like, I want a girl and I, that's what I'm gonna have. It's also some people that work in tech who are like, they want to like engineer their fa whole family mm -hmm. and so they're doing IVF and they're using a surrogate so that they can travel the world and do whatever they want to do and then have exactly the baby and the family that they're planning on having and then also expecting those children to really adhere to the gender stereotypes of this is what boys are like this is what girls are like we don't want toxic boys we want well-behaved obedient girls which then of course feeds into the thing of like Women are obedient, women listen, women behave, oh, yeah. which is very like trad wife bullshit, right? They don't know about us, do they? Well, there used yeah. to be a thing, I mean, before you had all this scientific assistance in choosing your gender, where, you know, oh, if you have sex this time of the of your ovulation, you have a better chance of having a boy. Or if, you know, if you eat a lot of acid food right before you uh, get inseminated, it'll be a girl. Right. You know, there used to be those kind of ways of, Chick picking and choosing. Sure, but yeah. chick pick. Did you just say chick picking? <laughs> no, but true. Is that what we're calling it now? Chick picking. Chick picking. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Um, to many, the prospect of raising a girl just feels as if it'll be easier. She's far less to commit a mass shooting or idolize Andrew Tate. She's also, points out Maori, less likely to be diagnosed with autism. Although a man striving to make as much money as possible might feel capitalist and gross, a woman do who does the same is a girl boss, a beloved trope among millennials, which I don't think that's true, but whatever. Some people's point who of view Who knows is what that. 20 years from now will bring also? Yeah. Still, the very act of sex selection is sexist, argues Arian Shavisi, a professor of philosophy at Brighton and Sussex Medical School in the UK, where elective sex selection is illegal. You can't actually foresee your child's gender, let alone how they will choose to express it or the qualities they will possess as a human being. So sex selection requires making a decision based on stereotypes. In turn, this feeds damaging systems of social organization, Shabisi told me. 
by reinforcing the idea that certain traits are biologically tied to sex, a view that has historically limited women. Selecting for girls might perpetuate negative views of boys and men. If you believe you can create a daughter with whom to have a deep emotional bond, why even try to cultivate that with a son? Yeah. I can see where it would depend to if there are like certain diseases within your family that are uh, more prominent in males or more prominent in females, you might want to choose the opposite sex. But you're having this genetic testing. Right. Well, you should... should be able to, if you have a disease like that in your family and you do the genetic testing that Michael and I already have gone through, you should be able to weed that out immediately. But then if you're with somebody who has that same genetic condition and you do choose to have a kid together, then you're going to do the testing that I'm doing to make sure that the embryos that you're creating don't have that. Uh -huh. Um and then I don't, I think, I I don't know. I want to say that if there are embryos that do then have those traits that they're not going to implant them or they're going to make you sign all kinds of things. Although is that unethical then that to, be, unethical, right? to be creating embryos that have these terrible genetic traits? And then weed them out. Or implant them anyway and like... I don't know. No, I don't. There's a whole lot going on here. Yeah. And so this is the point that I was telling you earlier. It's not just the UK, virtual all, all, virtually all the industrialized world, including Canada, Australia, and every European country besides Cyprus, bans sex selection, except in rare medical cases, which is what we're probably just talking about. Most nations prohibit the practice on the grounds that it promotes sexism and that children born from it may be harmed by gender expectations. Ah. Yeah. The widespread preference of a certain sex can also skew the population, as in India and China, where abortion and infanticide of girls has resulted in tens of millions more men than women. Amy, who's mentioned earlier in the story, who is Chinese-American, views her plan to select for girls as a reversal and a correction of her culture's historical preference for sons. In countries where infertility care is covered by insurance and provided by the government, sex selection is also seen as a frivolous waste of taxpayer funds. Although it's the same process as having this genetic testing done so i don't think it costs more but i know yeah i guess they just want to go nature's way of what comes comes and what doesn't come correct but if you have two embryos and one's a boy and one's a girl and you can pick i don't know there's kind of, kind of a whole lot of moral choices there i don't know yeah what if I find out the sex of both of them, and <laughs> can I have an embryo shower <laughs> where I where you're showered with embryos? Where uh, we find out the why not why not do a sex reveal of my embryos? Both of them? Yeah, I mean if they're both good, and I'm gonna be implanting them. Um, maybe we just have a, what if we have a cute little, uh, brunch or something and we have a cute little, like, cause I'm gonna look, I'm gonna feel, I guess the way I gotta think about it is like future facing, right? Where it's like, if we do the implantation, it doesn't take, I am, I am going to want to know at that point. So why not just have a cute little moment for it and celebrate as much as I can while I can and have a mimosa while I can, you know, like, cause I won't be able to once I'm implanted. No, I've, no, I've noticed about my drinking like a ton. Like I really haven't been drinking Just except for like a night or two out. Well, no, but I won't be implanted at that point. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, still just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I've, well, I've only ever been wanting to have like a drink. Well, like, well now anymore. you're making me want to find out if Baby boy embryos or baby girl embryos survive, have a better survival rate. Um, I mean, I used to hear, again, we're going back 30 some odd years ago, when baby girl embryos did have a better chance of survival because of a certain hormone wash that happens around the third month of pregnancy. And, and boys have to absorb more or whatever. And girls survived it better. Okay. Uh, nope. No, nope. you're wrong. No. According wrong. to Oxford in 2015, okay. the greater ratio of boys being born has been known since the 17th century. And since the 19th century, scientists have known that the mortality rate 
of male fetuses in the second half of pregnancy is higher than that of females. They have a higher mortality rate. It says the headline is female embryos less likely to survive at birth. Oh, no. Okay, wait. LiveScience.com says the key to the research is this. Male embryos and fetuses are known to be weaker. Uh -huh. They have to go through more in development, I think. Okay, so it seems like it's a, it's a difference of... Like, I think all genitalia starts out the same. And then there has to be this hormone wash in order for the male genitalia okay. to okay. develop. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, uh, the National Institute of Health says more male than female embryos develop at the blastocyst stage. Okay. So more boys then. But then the boy embryos and fetuses, according to LiveScience.com, are known to be weaker. And let's look at, let's just check the bibliography on this. Uh, interesting. Ralph, Catala Ralph Catalano and Tim Bruckner at the University of California, Berkeley, examined records of Swedes born between 1751 and 1912 to see what conditions they came into the world and how long they lived. Sweden is known for a long history of detailed records on births, oh. and the country also experienced famines and severe economic and social strain from a combination of harsh climate and frequent wars prior to the past century. The researchers had to go this far back in the records to survey a population that has, for the most part, passed on. The results may surprise you. Those born during bad economic times and other periods of high stress, male or female, actually had longer lifespans, suggesting the weaker among them were removed in the, fe fe in the fetal stage, ah. Catalano explained. And since more of the males would naturally have been weak, slamming them with the hormone would be a biologically beneficial way of quickly preparing the mother for another pregnancy instead of the possibility of wasting time on a birth that would not produce an ideally healthy child. Mother nature. So the male embryos and fetuses are weaker, but the ratio of boys being born is higher. Look this up yourself, folks. There's too many things. Yeah, female embryos less likely to survive to birth. Early embryos that are non-viable and miscarried very early in the pregnancy are more likely to be male, while the embryos that miscarry later in the first trimester are more likely to be female for reasons that remain unclear as of 2015. The study found that the chromosomal abnormalities that would normally make the embryos non-viable are more common in males. There's a specific link to one chromosome in particular, number 15, and some indication of links to chromosomes 7 and 17. But female embryos experience higher mortality overall. That suggests something other than chromosomal abnormalities is at play, and whatever that is may subtly adjust the proportions of male and female babies born, depending on social, environmental, and geographic circumstances. The higher female embryo mortality is particularly prevalent in the first trimester and levels off after 20 weeks. So, I mean, we are in a... a politically charged time oh are we in a stressful situation <laughs> so you know and i'm sure that Our, this baby should live to be a hundred i'm sure that the ivf at this all and like the checking Free testing and stuff is yeah yeah that we've been doing all this testing too so it kind of adjusts for for the chromosomal things and yeah. the other kind yeah. of things i'm gonna want to know right away let's just plan a let's just plan a let's just have a brunch and then an embryo blastocyst party? Yeah. A bl uh, should it be a, a blaster shower? A blaster shower. A, a blast. Then give us all the gender neutral presents. Yeah, I don't I don't expect presents at a blastocyst stage. Unless well, then it's like it a shower. Massages for me and stuff like that. No, shower me with love. Oh. I did a lot of fucking work <laughs> you to deserve, get here. You deserve uh, massages. Yeah. Because um, I'm going to humanize them regardless, and it's funny. We already, well, you got already humanized have. them. You've... I've anthropomorphized <laughs> them. So they're Ch it's Chip and Dale right now. Oh, they're Chip boys. I, no, no, no. I, I just kind of think Chip and Dale aren't really like. I guess they do have some toxic masculinity oh, in them both, but um, no, Chip and Dale kind of amorphously, yeah. Okay, let's put it this way. No matter what we get, we sure as hell are going to love it. 
crap out of it. No, I know that. And I, I feel like I do have a certain, I feel a certain generational responsibility to have a girl because I am the firstborn daughter, firstborn daughter, firstborn daughter, as far back as I go. Right. Just to, yeah. I, and it was funny. I, when I was getting my massage yesterday, we went up, we went up to Glen Ivy day spa and I was talking to the woman and she was like, she, the one who's giving me a massage and I was telling her about what I'm up to. She said, Oh, I'm the youngest. Um, I have four brothers. And I was like, well, you're still the first, firstborn daughter though. And she goes, I never thought about that. And I was like, yeah, girl, still are. Yeah. My, and- my mother was the firstborn daughter. But she had an older brother. Right. But then she had a bunch of younger sisters. Right. And so that's why there is, I I feel a pressure to have a firstborn daughter. And that just, that weighs on me. It really does. Like, because you can say it doesn't matter, but, and it doesn't. But then also I think sometimes too, that maybe that needs to end with me. Maybe that makes generational lines in the future like better and stronger maybe it's like like game of thrones where the all of us firstborn women are good strong women yeah but we're saddled with the responsibility you know what i mean like there's such a heaviness to it i think about game of thrones and there's that uh you know in game of thrones the dragons are like so weakened at the end that they went from being very huge to like little cats and I don't know. Sometimes I think that maybe there's a generational chain that needs to be broken for like the lineage to be stronger. And you're taking offense to that, but I it's not an offensive thing. It's like it's like we were firstborn women, firstborn women, firstborn daughters, firstborn daughters to like survive this. And now it's like a phoenix rising from the ashes as like a I don't know gender queer little baby boy who's like Ta-da! i've i i've surpassed it all who knows this is why i have the pressure to have a first one daughter <laughs> what am i saying you were keeping I... me looks <laughs> that's the look that's the look anyway i think i should have a blast to shower well we do have phoebe <laughs> Yeah, we do have Phoebe. It's a little strong little female. Yeah. Especially going through all she goes through. <laughs> She's so strong. Um, okay, I think this answers my question. So we'll get the answer to what the sex of both are. Yes. Um, perhaps I'll have them call Christina with that. Perhaps I'll saddle Christina with that, and then we'll have a little brunch, and we'll find out what my two embryos are. And I'm going to be attached to them regardless. I know that. And I Very like a little embryo. I'm so science based. And it's like with all this stuff about like Alabama and embryos and, you know, what people can and can't do with them. And like, I would still, I would still donate to science if it doesn't end up working out or, you know, I have an extra, if I do another egg retrieval and I have more eggs or whatever. Um, I would still do that. I still don't necessarily think of them as children yet but i don't not think chance, of them as children. children they're a chance for right. a child i was having a chat with a friend this week about i had a real moment the other night before i went to bed i don't know if i've maybe i've talked to you about this but losing the six eggs that weren't mature and then losing that fertilized egg that didn't develop is a very strange kind of grief and I hesitate to use the word grief because it feels I haven't sat in it I haven't been sad about it I haven't cried about it I've cried about only having three I think did I cry to you about it yeah I I did (laughs) it's hard to keep track it's years um but I haven't cried necessarily about the loss well grief i think takes different forms at different times yeah i mean like now 
when I was growing up and, you know, somebody would lose, have a miscarriage, it was like, oh, well, they had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. That was it. It was over with. And then they got pregnant again. But there was never like this, oh, you need to grieve about it. and you, It's a loss. And it, it is. But the times have just changed. That it, Even death, grief with death, I've seen it change over the years. Uh -huh. Because I've come from such a big family. Mm -hmm. It was always a funeral. You were always going to the funeral home. And it was just a time for family to come together, just be together, and let that person go. And you didn't say, oh... You know, Aunt Anna's really going to be grieving now, or Uncle Joe is really going to be grieving. It's no, I think they took coming and going a lot differently than we take coming and going now. I don't think you've ever sat mm -hmm. with your emotions. I mean. But that was just, that's where I come from. I know, it's People, East Coast. I had my father's oldest sister. Like, she lost every one of her brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. She was the oldest. And I used to think, why doesn't Aunt Kathleen, like, crying or anything? And it was just... It was a passing. It was a circle of life. Mm -hmm. And babies come and old people go. Mm -hmm. It would be harder, like, if, like, my, I lost one cousin at 21 from diabetes. And that was a hard, a hard loss. But as people got older and passed, it was just, it was what was meant to be. But this isn't getting older and passing. This is this never having the furthest far far from thing right. where it's not even a whole life that's mm -hmm. been lived and it's... So like i said there's different kinds of grief and i think you saw it in nine possibilities and then they dwindled down to three so fast yeah and it was fast too that's the other thing is that it was really quick because the next day yeah and um and then i think it was harder losing the third uh fertilized it, not for me. Wasn't harder for you to lose that one. Mm -hmm. I think I had more faith. I was expecting that I was going to survive. But I'm all three. And I was like, oh no, why? Yeah, I don't know that I processed losing the six eggs because I worked so hard at that. You know, I was stabbing myself mm -hmm. four to five times a day and like feeling the clementines in my gut. And like, I'm going to like tear up about it. I like, I worked so hard to get to that point and I stayed in and I relaxed and I like tried not to get too worked up because I can't not get worked up. It's just in my blood. Um, it's that firstborn daughter thing, but I worked so hard at it. And when I, I was hoping for more, I saw like good number. I got the numbers up at the end and I was like, yeah, no, see, I told you, I, see, I told you, I get it. And, um. And then, and then as we told it was nine, it was like, okay, that is a good solid number. I feel good about that. And then just losing six of them. And it's not even like, I can see why you would be more upset about the fertilized egg because it's closer to being mm. the thing that we want it to be. But I, those six worked really hard and they weren't fully ripe. And that was really just so frustrating. And I wanted a couple more of those to yeah. be on the other side of the attrition rate. And so that was really hard. And maybe I'll be more upset about losing the third fertilized egg, but I, I'm just not. I, and I guess too, because it was, there was so much more success on that side of it, right? Like on the one side of it, it was like, well, you have nine, but you've lost six. And now it's like, well, you have three, but you've lost one. So it's the, the, the ratio. The ratio is different. Um, but it's just been weird. And, and talking to my friend this week about it, it was like, it's not huge, but it's really not nothing. Mm -hmm. It's really something. And, and it's weird to not have something tangible. I don't, I have, I have the videos of the sonograms of my ovaries. Mm -hmm. But I don't see the eggs in there. I mm -hmm. just see follicles. And then those six eggs are gone, and I don't have that. I can't go bury them or yeah, take that... them to the sea, you know. And then that fertilized egg, I have, you know, I hope they did some science tests on it because that's my thing is I want to give back to the community at large, well, the, human, <laughs> the human experience. I'm sure they'll have tests of what, what they followed. And that's what I signed. I signed, like, do... Do science tests on this place. Mm -hmm. take, take it to the science fair. 
Yeah, it's like your godfather. Like they went through so many times of getting pregnant and losing, but they miscarried. Mm -hmm. And he always said that that was the worst part was that they had nothing tangible. Well, you kind of do have something tangible there, but it's not. Yeah. But he says that they couldn't go to a funeral. They didn't have the fetus. Well, a a lot of times, too, people I'm finding as I have conversations with people who don't understand this process, they don't know how to react, even when it's good news. If you go back to the last episode and listen to Mike receiving the news, me being like, I have an embryo. He's like, okay. Yeah. And I'm like, it's good. I'm happy. And he's like, oh, okay. And I said, the other two ways to make it. He's like, oh, okay. And so like people don't understand because this process is so weird and foreign to so many people. And some people you hear, oh, well, they got 22 eggs. So when they reach it, it's like, what? Yeah, yeah, and and they're all in freezers somewhere. They're not even getting used right now. Yeah, uh, and then other people like that. Well, you got four. You only got you got four eggs. Yeah, yeah. There was that lady on the other side of the curtain for me who mm-hmm. only got four, and that was so yeah upsetting to hear. But then she could have fertilized all four, and all four could have become embryos. That's and she true. could be so, in a better spot than hey, me. But this is your science class for the day, guys. <sighs> because there's so much work I still have to do of you know doing the implantation and then and then waiting two weeks to see if it worked well i I haven't even gotten there learning that they're a-okay then getting to the implantation waiting two weeks to see if that works and then waiting that first trimester to make sure it all sticks and i i guess i don't still have six months after that to worry about itself and then the birth to worry about and then if it's gonna you know fall over and hit its head or you know like or get in a car accident or like there's so many things to there's so many things to worry about um shall i say to you welcome to parenthood oh my god just don't say that to her just wait i hate it people rubbing their noses rubbing their parenthood at in my nose is that rubbing my nose in their parenthood that's um yeah all, all of life is worrying that's all it's that's all we're here for we worry till we die then we die i'm not worried right now i Me feel either. good about it everything's about gonna be great and maybe we find out tomorrow and if not I have a stacked week. So I'm recording this on Sunday. Sunday the 19th. It is the 25th anniversary of the Phantom Menace. Um, <laughs> it can rent a car now. And uh, this week, so I have this, I'm going to an event tonight. Tomorrow I'm going to coffee in LA. I have a stacked work day to make sure everything's taken care of because on Tuesday I fly to Vegas and I have a conference that I'm going to in addition to a lovely dinner with you. Then we're going to see the Beatles love. Then I'm going to convince you to see a show at the Sphere the next night. And then I fly back into town and I have a, a premiere that I'm going to with Christina. So look forward to that on social media. And before the premiere, I have the call with my doctor to go over all of the information. Because some somewhere in that time between Monday and Thursday, I will find out that the embryos are okay. And to go back to something I said in the last ep- last episode or the episode before that, I have a hard time keeping up with like what I've edited and what I've posted and whatever. But I talked about how good it was that I was up in San Francisco for everything because I had a stacked calendar and I didn't have time to sit around and ponder and think. So, <laughs> yeah. Let's call Christina and tell her she's going to learn about my embryos. Before us. Yeah. Hey, Hello. Christina, I'm currently recording my podcast right now, and you're on speakerphone. Okay, that sounds fun. <laughs> I have been waffling back and forth about whether or not I want to learn about the sex of my embryos. Uh-huh. And what I've decided is that I want you to learn about the sex of my embryos, and then I want to have a blast of shower. Shut up. <laughs> do you like that? I do. Okay. 
All right, so let's talk location. <laughs> no, like, how do we do this? Where do we... Oh, you know, we said go. That'd be really super cute. We can go to the Kookaburra Lounge. Oh, perhaps. It's cute. And then, oh, and it has, like, greens and pinks. Great. So that way it kind of like goes into things, which I mean, obviously not necessarily saying that we have to ascribe to any type of change of stereotypes or that any of those things matter in the long run. That's what your child will or will not be. That's not a choice that we get to make. They decide that they are for themselves. However, it will be really fun and very cute. We're just going to find out. We're just going to celebrate the kind of genitalia they're likely to have. <laughs> and now my cuckoo clock's going off, so... All right, stay tuned, folks. I think we're going to have a blast of shower episode coming at you. It's going to be a blast of this. The Backup Plan is created, produced, and hosted by me, Meredith Kate. Julian Hagens is my co-producer. You can find us on social media at Backup Plan Pod. The best place to get updates is to sign up for our newsletter at BackupPlanPod.com, where we also post all episodes, show notes, and transcripts. Thank you for listening. <laughs>